Thank you for listening to the Clive Barker podcast, the only podcast dedicated to the imagination of Clive Barker. Uh, in episode 167, uh, Jose and Ryan, that's me, and Marcus and Rob, we talk about the 1977 play, The Magician. Uh, and this episode is sponsored by Don Bertram's Celebrate Imagination. Uh, his Celebrate Imagination shop is dedicated to benefiting the arts and medicine program at Texas Children's Cancer Center. Up to 50% of the proceeds uh, from his shop will support the program where art artist Don Bertram volunteers monthly. So please join, join us in donating to the program at Texas Children's Cancer Center. There's a link in the show notes on, and on the main site at uh, clivebarkercast.com that will take you where you need to go to buy one of his prints or art books and help this wonderful program. Uh, thank you, Don Bertram. Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode 167 of the Clive Barker podcast. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about The Magician. And as usual, you have me, Joe. I'm Ryan. I'm Rob. And I'm Marcus. And so uh, welcome to this episode. We're going to be discussing the Clive Barker play script of The Magician. So, uh, hey, guys, how are you doing? Good. Doing well. Good. Yeah. Can't complain. I was really happy so, to get these play scripts in the mail, um, just to see what they what they look like for the first time, you know, to hold them in your hand, and um, they're really cool. And it, it's neat that they're they're um, they're the cost is low on these, so people could use them to put up their own productions. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, they're really cheap considering. And Mo- they always do a great job on the. Uh, on the extra material that they include in these editions and uh, starting with yeah. the cover, of course, this great picture of, uh, uh, on the magician cover, I think, yeah. is there a name for this one inside? Let's see. I can't tell. I think this painting might be entitled. Was this painting done specifically for this, uh, uh, book or is this another think... painting from one of his collections? I think it's from his collection. Okay. I yeah, I was looking through the archive, and there's actually a different painting from Aberat that's titled The Magician. Oh, uh, I see. Uh, it's uh, a bluish character with, uh, like, candle flames all over the rim, the brim of his hat. Oh, okay. And so I wasn't sure if possibly hmm. that was originally supposed to be for this play or if it's just a coincidence of title. Because in the world of Aberat, the magicians get their power from hats, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, so what? what is this play about? Let's see. This says that um, it is about um, a bunch of Commedia dell'arte characters um, that the Daw Company used to include in several plays. And they're also known as, you know, pantomime theater characters. Um so one of them is called Pantalone, and uh, he is a person of some stature, and his wife, yeah. Uh, yeah, he was, like, described as the governor. Yeah. There you go. The Pantalone. He, yeah, he's yeah. kind of a, a tyrant uh, from uh-huh. yeah. the way the other characters describe him. And so his wife is infatuated by this guy, that uh, this magician called Cagliostro. And uh, she invited him over to the house, and of course, hijinks are going to ensue. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, Pantalone wasn't very happy that she invited him without him not knowing about it. Right, right. Cagliostro is mostly just known for his reputation, and his reputation is huge. Um, he, that uh, he's been kicked out of various countries, and and um, he's got a he's killed cut. kings being a. It, a, a, a magician that can do all, all these crazy things. Yeah. I wonder if Clive based this off uh, Cogliostro off the Count uh, Alessandro. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. If y'all, you think that's who that was based off of? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's some people here. I, what, what? So the Commedia dell'arte characters here are used as generic characters. You can hang whatever mm-hmm. vignette you want on, on these characters to make theater. And I... I particularly love the photos at the end of the play script book where you can see photos of these 1978 costumes in production. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And um, so a quick a quick uh, mention of, of who played what here is um, 
Let's see, where is it? It's at the end of the story here. Uh, page 69. There you go. Thank you very much. Yeah. So Harlequin was played by Douglas Bradley, oh, Doug Bradley, like most people know him. Um, a zany was played by Lynn Darnell, who would become uh, Doug's first wife. Uh, Pantalone, the government, was played by Peter Atkins, who joined the doc company when he was uh, still a, a young, strapping lad. Um, Andrea, the governor's wife, was played by Clive Barker. Mm -hmm. Columbine, yeah. in love with Harlequin, was played with by Lynn Darnell. Pierrot, a buffoon, in love with Columbine, was played by Clive Barker again. And Cogliostro was played by Phil Rimmer. So very, very interesting things, um, very interesting cast, and a lot of it we saw in The Forbidden. Yes. Yeah. And if you that, look at uh, the, yeah. Kabuki, like Kabuki costume was uh, in part of The Forbidden, right? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, that, the magician's costume. Yeah, the, yeah, one, that, the, the one that the, looks like the demon. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah, the one that looks like the demon we saw it before in The Forbidden. I guess they were just reusing that because it's a pretty impressive costume. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think what really brings the magician home for me is that more than a story about a swindler, in this case Cagliostro, who lives more due to his reputation than, than the actual tricks he performs. Yeah. He's yeah. like uh, he's like Oz. That's what it reminded me of. Right, he's the great and powerful <laughs> yeah. Oz. Pay no attention to the man behind the yeah, curtain. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So yeah. he actually does perform magic at some point and even creates life, uh, which elevates him from a kind of a mere swindler to almost having godlike powers. Uh, and he just realizes that near the end of the story. And even Cagliostro, you know, seems surprised with his success and 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 vindicated by the the revelation at the end, which I'm I'm probably not going to mention what it is, but uh, yeah. I think the, the magician's work here is really to influence people by any means or, or talent necessary. And uh, I think we've we've talked in The Forbidden about that. Clive talks about that sort of influence in the interviews in that disc, that the artist is kind of a magician because he his work influences people in a distance. And uh, so I thought that was that was pretty cool. It's yeah. also interesting in a, in a literal sense that his um, the, the magic spells that he get, that he does to try to cheat people are, are real. Like um, the magic circle that he creates, uh, then the, uh, uh, an actual like fantastical creature that's not born of man uh, mm -hmm. can't, can't enter the circle. And then he he, he gives that love spell to uh, Pantalone or not no to uh, Columbine. Uh, Columbine. Yeah, yeah. and uh, and it, and it's a real it's a real spell. It actually does something, even though yeah. I don't think that he believed that it was. Yeah. I think that the magician is um, what the magician wants to do really is break the rules of the world and kind of mold it into shape of its own design. Like mm -hmm. the, the changing of uh, lead into gold, right, was the most well-known sought after secret or the creation of life through the homunculus is another yeah. one. Even yeah. even Aleister Crowley uh, left behind uh, uh, essays and stuff where he talked about how to create the homunculus and stuff. And um, so, uh, and the Philosopher's Stone, I mean, for people who are f familiar with the name from the Harry Potter books, um, the, the, the Philosopher's Stone is an example the, of the desire to attain youth, perfection, fortune, you know, they wanted to create the, uh, the, the fountain of youth, right? It would be something that ultimately the great work is the talent to change bad energy and convert it into positive energy without letting it affect you or anyone else, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I al I also got a uh, almost a Dr. Faustus feeling, mm -hmm. especially in the beginning. Uh, Dr. Faustus it opens with uh, a chorus, pretty much touting the uh, the resume and the reputation of of Faustus. And uh, I mean, this play opens pretty much in the same fashion, and it reminded me of that for for that reason with the mm -hmm. Harley Quinn doing that, and. Uh, one of the descriptions as well also reminded me of uh, Rictus from The Thief of Always, in that sure. Cagliostro is coming not on a horse or in a carriage, but flying, no doubt, spreading his fingers and passing over Europe in a twinkling, <laughs> darkening the sun in a dozen capitals, et cetera. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like like the devil does in the Faustus film. Um, if you ever seen that uh, silent film Faustus? Oh yeah, that's by uh, Morel, right? Yeah, uh, the yeah. same director of uh, Nosferatu. Mm -hmm. 
and you see the devil is kind of like spreading his wing and kind of uh, mm-hmm. dropping a shadow over the city. Yeah. Kind of the same thing. Um, so, yeah, yeah. And, and it's interesting that alchemy in some ways was also an early form of science, you know, especially chemistry, uh, where people would burn metals and powders and crucibles and try to create new substances yeah. or even discover what composed certain mixtures and try to separate it into elements. And uh, they would accidentally poison themselves sometimes because they'd, they'd be burning stuff that was like super toxic. And uh, and then they would get even more crazy <laughs> and more eccentric. Yeah. And then alchemy was always seen as this forbidden thing. I mean, like that's even in Frankenstein is that's what Victor uh, teaches himself as he reads the works of alchemists. And that's right. what dives him down that rabbit hole. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned Frankenstein um, because it's most yeah, it's, I'll just, it's, it's my favorite book, so I'll, I'll mention that a lot. So <laughs> sorry, it's pretty cool. I mean, I, have you had? I had a chance to read. Um, there's a Penguin Classics uh, version that has not only the accepted second draft that most people know the, the 1918 original by yeah. Shelley himself without yeah. uh, without Percy's input. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because Percy, Percy had a lot of influence on the second draft. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah. and the first, yeah. But it's interesting because most people think that the Frankenstein book is going to have all that stuff about lightning, but that's just completely from the movie. Yeah. It's yeah. just from the yeah. Universal yeah. film. It's the James yeah. Well films, yeah. I mean, yeah. there's, there's, I think there's just one line of galvanism, and that's, that's pretty much it. They never uh, specifically say how the creature is made, just that his eyes open and, you know, that he's brought to life, but not how. Yeah, almost unnoticeably, he's just like by the light of the candle standing uh-huh. by the body that he created, and all of a sudden he sees like a yellow eye open. Yeah, the yellow like, eye opening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I it's very, it was... very subdued. It's not as dramatic as the movie. Yeah. If you look at those, you know, pictures in the back, Peter Atkins costume for uh, Pantalone is kind of very reminiscent of uh, Boris Karloff's costume from Frankenstein. If you kind of oh, notice. Really? Oh, yeah, similar. yeah. I see, like the dark suit and kind of like the yeah. face that looks almost scarred. Okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. Let's draw a comparison there. Yeah, yep. I like that. So there's two uh, love triangles in this play. Um, of course, one of them is kind of like this love triangle between um, Cogliostro, uh, the governor's wife, Andrea, and... Um, Columbine and uh, and Pantalone, and then the other one is Columbine, Piero, and Harlequin, right? Yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. That's funny. That's a funny one. Yeah, no. One of the things about he gets what they want. Yeah, yeah. One of the great things about this, uh, another great thing about this uh, uh, play, is that it's very funny. <laughs> Some really yes. good dialogue yeah. in this. Yeah. And, you know. Yeah, I, I I I laughed out loud, legitimately. Yeah, I know. Me too. Yeah. I really liked uh, Parrot. I thought he was very funny. And this this dynamic between Columbine, Harlequin, and uh, Pierrot, that comes from the Commedia dell'arte, and it actually is there. Like, you know, that Columbine is always kind of like this voice of reason, um, very self, self-assured self woman. Um, sometimes she doesn't even wear masks. Sometimes she's just like a normal woman. But, uh, but yeah, a Harlequin, of course, we're all familiar with, you know, the, uh, the Harlequin yeah. suit. Yeah, and how how he's supposed to look, and uh, Piero as well. He's a little guy with a black cap on his head and the white face with a little uh, black diamond or black tear on the corner of his eye. That mo- most people, most grandfathers had a, p- a picture of Piero somewhere in their house. <laughs> oh, is that how you me. pronounce that? Piero, not Parrot. I thought it was Parrot, so it's Piero. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's kind of like a French-sounding the... name. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so the, the, these characters go back a long time, you know, from the 16th through the 18th century. Uh, these characters of the Committee de l'Arte, and uh, you know, they use those those paper mache masks. And I think here in the pictures at the end, those those masks that the Doc Company created, they totally look like they have the 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 Clyde Barker uh, aesthetic seal on it, right? Mm-hmm. Aesthetic, exactly. Yeah, very creepy, and weird. Very, very creepy. Very great work, especially the backdrop that they made for this play. Yeah, I was just about to say that I love the painting, and I, but yeah, I'm sure Clive did that. Very, um, it, it looks like this should belong in an illumination in a book somewhere. 
because mm-hmm. there's like two characters, two fantastic characters jousting, and one of them's like one of them is on top of a lion, the other one's on top of a, a griffin, I think. Yeah, yeah. Pretty fantastic for 1978, I think. And it says right here that uh, and and afterward by uh, Phil and Sarah Stokes, which I, I love the title they picked for it, because I, I can always well, imagine. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> a fine line between trickery and divinity. <laughs> Who was that guy that said that in the movie? Uh, um, Vinovich. Yeah, Vinovich. Yeah. Nice accent. What is yeah, that? No, I was, I was, hey, I fuck you, the more. <laughs> yeah, I was waiting for you to say that. <laughs> that is a great scene in like Lord yeah, of the Rings. Yeah. Uh, when he just exposes the magician for just being a swindler, really. Mm-hmm. He's someone who is a totally self-made, uh, uh, an illusion. It's another illusion. The personality of the magician is just another illusion. They are always yeah. fake. They're always fake. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's great. I also like, and I also really appreciate that the way that Phil and Sarah are releasing these um, these books, they're in packs of two, and there's always one that's never that wasn't released previously in in like yeah. forms of heaven and incarnations, and then one that was. So here we've got the magician and history of the devil, and then next time there's going to be hunters of the snow in the snow is new, and then uh, crazy oh, face, cra- yeah, crazy, crazy face. face, yeah, which was previously. Also, which I've not read. I'll probably get both of those mm-hmm. when they come out. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. sure. I'll probably yeah, yeah. get get them all. I mean, this it's a, it's a, they're so affordable. Yeah, yeah. That that's the nice thing is that they're really cheap and they're also really good quality. And I just I love the covers. Yeah. And there, there's other people around this time, apart from, like, Rob, you mentioned that Clive might have taken model Cagliostro after the Count, Count Cagliostro. And uh, and the real-life Cagliostro is a pretty amazing swindler. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, he even got a, an opera in three acts written about his, his uh, adventures by Johann Strauss. <laughs> it's called Cagliostro in Vienna. And uh, it's a fantastic, fantastic thing. I, I, I think I found it on Spotify. I listened to it while I was uh, reading the book. Oh, so wow. I recommend nice. it. Yeah. Um, and uh, Cagliostro, I mean, he was uh, born in, in 1743. And he was uh, a guy actually called Giuseppe Balsamo. Again, totally created name. Um, and he was uh, Italian. And uh, a lot of these guys, um, most of their reputation was just based off word of mouth misinformation, you could say, um, uh, that they would throw out there and then that other people would perpetuate. But um, but he was also like, mystic. You, he was like saying, I'll give you like he would did, for well, he was like, I'll give you great amounts of power if you just give me some of your money. And people actually bought into that kind of stuff. Simple little tricks of the mind that way Mm -hmm. what he used to do and the thing is you can always count on people's pride if they were swindled they wouldn't admit to it they would probably say no no he really did that yeah Yeah, Yeah. you guys should totally (laughs) get him invite him and 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 see what he can do and in a way they would just spread it out yeah it uh, it perpetuates it yeah exactly exactly so um yeah he it's not that these people were complete swindlers, though. I mean, some of them actually did have some sort of mystical uh, initiation, or they, they they knew people, or they always moved in the high spheres, right? Yeah. That's, that's where power is. The real power is, is in the high spheres. In this case, it was the nobles and the salons of influential people, and they would just rub shoulders with them. And, and by by turn, they would become famous themselves and be invited to other people's houses. So that was pretty fantastic. But yeah, he was involved in that affair of the diamond necklace that involved uh, Marie Antoinette and Prince Louis. And uh, he, um, it was about this mistress, I think, and there was this diamond necklace, or maybe a diamond necklace was made for Marie Antoinette. And, uh, a diamond necklace was made for a mistress of Louis. And then I think they tried selling it to Mary Antoinette, and she's like, no, I don't want a necklace that was made for somebody else. And then the jewelers were trying to sell that necklace for a while, and then someone tried swindling that necklace in a way. It, it, it's, you can find that online, the full story of that. But uh, 
the 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 point is that Cagliostro ended up uh, imprisoned in the Bastille for uh, nine months, but actually he he was then released. But uh, just because he was involved with this whole f affair, he got he got to spend nine months in the Bastille. Um, so he was uh, he was not um, a stranger to adversity, you know, very much like Casanova, who would get himself into trouble. And um, and there were other figures like this magician. You know, have you guys ever heard about the Count of Saint Germain? No, I've heard that yeah. before. He was a European adventurer, and um, it was rumored that this guy could turn invisible, that this guy was was immortal, that this guy was the wandering Jew from the Bible, and all that stuff. That some said he was 500 years old, and. And uh, Voltaire himself, the philosopher, actually uh, sarcastically named him the Wonder Man. So, <laughs> yeah, he was another guy who, you know, claimed to be a noble, which was probably not true. And uh, yeah, and yeah, basically, he just liked to um, to uh, to rub shoulders with famous people and um, pretend like he was very, very cultured and. Uh, um, so yeah, the Count of Saint Germain, and uh, he he ended up being employed by Louis the Fifteenth for uh, some diplomatic missions. Um, so yeah, um, these people would often have some sort of mystical initiation, and they would claim to be no magic and all this and that. So, and then you even have like scientists, or what passed by scientists back then, like um, have you guys heard of of you know when someone says oh I'm mesmerized? They're really right. referring to Franz Anton Mesmer, who was a physician, I think, um, a German physician. And he would use uh, magnets to uh, to put people in a trance. Yeah, and he came oh, wow. up with this idea about uh, animal magnetism was a thing. And basically, what it was is just he was using not just static electricity, but magnetism and magnets, like Ryan said. And then he would also use a, a kind of a form of hypnotism. And he would perform these tricks in, like, salons and parlors and, uh, you know, places all over um, Germany and, I think, France. So, um, yeah, and to this day, I mean, he's part of the uh, popular, you know, uh, uh, um, I wouldn't say vernacular, yeah, but language, yeah. but yeah. through the use of, of mesmerized, you know, because that comes from his name. Yeah, it's in the lexicon now, so. Yep. Yeah. yep. And I guess some people thought this was magic. Of course, now we know this was nothing else but magnets and static electricity and a little bit of hypnotism and suggestion. And he would do what people do now in, like, really bad casino shows where it's like, oh, I'd like to invite these four people to the, ch the stage, and you're going to be a chicken, you're going to be a clown, you're going to be this, and then they actually get up and start doing it. Of course, it's all fake. They're all in on the act, but... Uh, yeah. But, you know, if you put, like, one person from the audience in the middle of all those, he's probably going to think, hey, I have to play along, because maybe, you know, there is something to this, and I'm the only guy who's not hypnotized what do i do yeah you know there's been stuff that proves that the power of suggestion and the the power of you know herd mentality can actually make people think that they're under some sort of like influence when they're really not mm -hmm. so again you know, that's great, the work of the magician uh, the, uh, there's a movie called isn't it called the magician that mm -hmm. was directed by christopher nolan that really is kind of like a twist on all like it all being kind of you know Oh the, fake. oh, the Prestige? Yeah, The Prestige. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a really good film. If anybody's yeah. into, like, you know, magic or anything like that, where a nice little twist on the, the Yeah, the two, uh, two dueling uh, magicians, and one of, them, one of them might actually have powers. Yeah. Hugh Jackman yeah. and uh, um, Christian, Bale. Christian Bale. Yeah. And David Bowie plays Tesla. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It that was an excellent movie. Around that time, there was another movie that came out called The Illusionist with uh, Ed, Ed Norton. I never saw that one. Was that? I'll have to check that out. That is also very good. And oh, I guess yeah. that was the time when movies about magicians were coming out. So. Yeah, I, I think both of those actually came out the same year. Yeah. If my, yeah, if my memory serves me correctly. I saw both of those at the same time. I think the prestige name comes from the... The, the the three acts of a magic trick, right? Like there's the uh, the setup, there's mm -hmm. the illusion, yeah. and there's the prestige at the end, which is when the audience kind of gasps at what happened. And uh, yes. I think that's yeah. So the illusionist is also pretty good. I think it's got Ed Norton in it, and 
You guys should check that one out if you haven't seen it. It's, re it's a very good movie. I think <clears throat> with this play, there are also some some interesting connections. Uh, connections to Clive, stuff that Clive Barker would do later. Um, like the, the uh, when he's describing the demon that he's going to summon uh, for um, f for Andrea. He, he, mm -hmm. he, he says he's a demon and an angel. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. Demons to some, angels to others. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one line that stuck out to me that I made it or immediately made me think of a uh, an Aberat painting is on the first page. And uh, they're talking about uh, the Harlequin is talking about the birds are high in the air, the fish are swimming. And then later on, uh, there's a line that says, with fish swimming in the air around my head. And uh, I don't know if you guys remember the painting. There's a painting from Aberat of a uh, a man in overalls, and there's a fish just swimming in the air right by his head. <laughs> yes. So just Wasn't even... The, that kind of reminds me, too, of uh, the fish part. Isn't that part of, like, Thief of Always, the fish? And there's some kind of, like, fish analogy in there. Like, uh, yeah, well, yeah, the, the little the, lake where yeah, the kids the get turned into... Yeah. Fish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Almost like is that that's uh, like Pinocchio, where they get turned to the donkeys. You you guys mentioned that uh, the the scene with the fish over the head and all that, and I remember when Pantalone is talking about seeing the face of Cagliostro as if by warped glass, and of course that's then we realize that that's the the surface of the water when it's like agitated, and you look through it. If you're under a pool and you look up, you see like everything is kind of like. Uh, distorted, yeah. and that's when you realize that oh, I, know, I guess I know who Pantaloni really is now. And uh, yeah. you know, oh, nice, that, that where he a, comes from. That was a cool revelation about uh, about Pantalone that he was really. I mean, I don't know. I guess we could spoil it. I I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Know. Uh, yeah, that he he's really the the homunculus that uh, yeah that Cagliostro summoned so long, a long time ago and, and coming back to this place, even though he was invited by Andrea for him, it was a homecoming because this was his home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sure. Um, I, I'm not sure if Cagliostro really used to live in that house or if it's just him like pretending to be more important than he really was. But now, now that you mention it, yeah, he might've actually lived in that house. Because that might have been the only place that Pantalone knew as his own house. I, I think that it was his house because he talks about um, he, he in monologue he talks about yeah, it being his the house. monologue. Yeah, right, right. Another thing that's typical from like the Clive Barker play scripts is that uh, it's common in these Clive Barker plays to have a narrator breaking the fourth wall to talk to the yeah, audience, yeah. talking directly to the audience, uh, like Our the history of the devil. Of yeah. The, like the history of the devil does the same with the the reporter that's covering the the trial. It's like uh, uh, he he keeps doing that. Like of course because in in some in some ways uh, I guess what I listened to most was the 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 audio production by the Seeing Ear Theater. And in that case, that really works much better because you actually have a narrator explaining what's happening in the scene. Yeah. So. But here it is because this play is what in some um, – it's what's referred to as, as a harlequinade because Harlequin is narrator and he's he's the one who's basically the, the narrator of the play. Mm -hmm. And I think this is an artifice of theater that I've always enjoyed. I mean I've seen other plays where the same thing happens. Sometimes the characters in the play will turn to the audience and say – and look at them and say something funny and the audience laughs and they're like addressing the audience directly. And – I guess, you know, it's the ease with which the characters slide in and out between their world of fantasy and our reality as spectators turns them into these creatures that have a power that we do not. I always thought of the magic of theater is that is the working of inhabiting the character, you know, the art of representation versus the art of experiencing. It's in itself a ritual that's almost magical on its own. And it's like they're going from this fantasy world into our world as spectators, and then they go back to the scene. And I always thought that was interesting. It's always something that made, kind of tickles my funny bone in a way. And, and uh, in an interview, in the, in, in it's, in, it's, uh, it's put in the afterword here that uh, Clive Barker had also talked about the magic of, of people that, want, that, that go to plays or go to movies and, mm -hmm. and, and, 
and they're going there wanting to be tricked, you know, wanting yeah. to be to made made to to believe in the in this world that they're that that they're you know temporarily inhabiting while they while they watch these things or be entertained. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That uh, reminds me of uh, a quote from a Magica of uh, magic is the the first and last religion of the world, and. Uh, and I think Clive also has some quote where he talks about uh, that shamans are, are pretty much the uh, the first magicians because uh, just the act of like resurrection and everything. And he compares it to uh, to sawing the woman in half and right. and whatnot. Right. And uh, so I mean, it just seems like magic uh, has just always been very. Uh, integral to Clive's work and uh and magic is always a performance right I mean the shamans were the original method actors <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because when they, yeah when they put the skin on their shoulders and the the horns in their head they are a deer they're no longer a human now they're mm-hmm. inhabiting the spirit of the deer so in some ways it's kind of almost like like what, what I was saying the 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 art of of experiencing the 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 you know when you when you talk about method acting and you go into the Stanislavski system and and how they they practice uh, what's it called um, the the emotional experience using their own emotional experience to to uh, to to become the character and so in that in that sense like yeah the shamans they would stick the the fur on their shoulders and the horns in their head. And now they're a deer and they're going to imitate the deer noises and they're going to dance around the fire. And so in, in, it's a performance, it's theater, you know, and, yeah. and it's magic at the same time. So that's, I guess that's, that's what, uh, what Clive synthesizes in this play is that the magician is an artist and a performer. Um, and magic is a product of that in a way. Oh, oh, here goes a really good quote by Clive. Uh, He says, A great magician, for a moment, suspends everything you believe about the world. It's an extraordinary power. They stand back with that smug smile that says, Look what I did. I'm a miracle worker. And as a writer and director, I understand that. I'm trying to do exactly the same thing to my audience. Make them believe, for a moment, that these miracles are real. That is a wonderful yeah. quote. Yeah, it's a very yeah, and I'm guessing that's uh, from when he was making Lord of Illusions. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, and it's and interesting, this, this think... b- back and forth between um, talking about magicians as tricksters and magicians doing, you know, and then the real magic of it being making people believe. Like a lot of, you know, creators in general are like, magicians like you know marcus your paintings you're like a magician in your your own right oh you know, well, thank you thank like, you so much you that, know with that, you know, with your work and sure it's a way to know. exercise you know your own personal demons sometimes when you make yeah them, right? yeah that, that's how i feel about it for sure yeah uh, it is a uh a, a conjuring of of uh almost like metaphysical things that you don't really understand or know and there is an alchemy i think to to painting and i mean that's that's what i feel either when i am painting or you know say looking at clive's paintings it it is this very uh transcendent thing in my opinion yeah i mean you guys have been to seraphim i mean just i always said it's like uh for me it was like a catholic going to the vatican (laughs) <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, it definitely yeah. felt like that. Yeah, and, it's so overwhelming and so sublime and uh yeah, I I I do think art is magic to me, definitely. It felt a bit like uh I felt more like Alice in Wonderland when she crosses the the looking glass and yeah. then on the other hand, on the other side it's just a total magic wonderland and it's yeah. you just want to crawl into those those canvases sometimes it's like especially the big ones yeah yeah and you just look at that and you're like you see the whole topography of the you know the the impacted paint that he that he uses, and he you see the, the the scratches of the knife, and 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 how much paint he put on this one like piece, and, and there's really like if you pass your fingers over it, it's 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 very rough, very coarse, and there's like little mounds of paint here and there, mm-hmm. and you almost want to like inhabit that world, and uh, yeah, it's it's pretty amazing. 
So uh, in this book, when when Cagliostro claims that he can uh, call a demon, I think the demon's name was um, Orias. Was that was that the demon's name? No, I can't remember. I, I can't yeah, I don't remember. I, wish I had written that down, but I didn't. Yeah, I, I read it last week, so it's been a <laughs> yeah. week of. Yeah. Let me just look it up real quick. Um, I think it is Orias. That, uh, of course, the the demon is going to be fake uh, in this one, but. Um, so Orias was actually a goetic demon. Goetia. No, it is Orias. Yeah, I see it. Yeah. A pure Orias. Yeah. And, and, and uh, yeah, that's the part where uh, they're trying to, to set up the, the, the code word for him to show up in his costume. And, it, and then it just keeps failing. Um, so the, the Ars Goetia and a, Goetia, a goetic demon, Goetia comes from uh, sorcery. So the Ars Goetia is actually the art of sorcery. And that's the name of a 17th century compilation. And in English, it is called The Lesser Key of Solomon. Oh, yeah, I have that book. Right, right. And so Orias, in that book, I think he is a grand marquis of hell. Uh, he had uh, he commanded 30 legions of demons. He uh, teaches the virtues of the stars and the mansions of the planets, um, depending on the astrological sign in which uh, the person... So the, I mean, the, so basically he, uh, he, he kind of rules the zodiac, I think. Hmm. So uh, yeah, that's that's who Orias is. It's a real, um, a real, or should I say, a, a real name that exists from the Ars Galicia for this wow. uh, Grand Marquis of Hell. Uh, well, who wrote that book? By chance, you know, the Lesser Key of Solomon. Um, Solomon, I think. <laughs> oh, okay. I just got this one. And it says Alistair Crowley wrote it. That's no. It's okay. it's from the mid 17th century, and um, I think it's kind of an anthology of older things. Um, oh, okay. So the 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 thing that the copy that exists, I think, was um, was was made after a copy from another book. Oh, so I'm, yeah. I don't really know a lot about it, but. Uh, yeah, I think yeah, I think the, Crawley might have been involved in translating some of it. Maybe yeah. this is a translation of that. Yeah, so it, was, it was compiled in the mid 17th century from from there materials a couple of centuries older. Okay. Yeah. So I think it was it was also called the Book of the Goetia of Solomon the King. Um, but you know they they put Solomon King Solomon's name on it, but I doubt that he ever had anything to do with this. It's just you know kind of an anthology of old spells and old like demon yeah. hierarchies and stuff like that. So who knows who came up with that originally, right? I mean, it's just something something that usually a grimoire would be like just a gathering of, of old spells into a single cover, and then they it would become like this important book for anybody who was dabbling in the occult. Um, yeah. Yep. I, so, yeah. But in this case, Orias is being eaten alive by fleas in this play, which <laughs> right. makes for a really funny moment. I guess that's yeah. one of the laugh out loud moments, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Another yeah, one for was me great. was when when he was asking for for them to give up their gold and that he would turn him into a precious metal called scatolinium, which mm -hmm. you could only imagine what scatolinium is. I mean, it kind of sounds like it's made out of crap or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good, point. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Good point. It's uh, yeah. It's like saying, "Give me some scotch and vodka, and I'll make up a scotchka." <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, so yeah, uh, great stuff here, uh, especially the fine line between trickery and divinity, yeah. because uh, like like uh, I think Marcus mentioned this before. There's some great quotes from Clive here, and there's a, a story of you know uh, the the evolution of the dog theater, uh, the uh, dog company. And an evolution of how this um, this text came to be, and how it evolved, and how it was put together as a play. Well, and it's yeah, really I, I, interesting the homecoming aspect, like the home, the 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 the, 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 the magician returning home. I mean, it's it's Lord of Illusions. It seems like yeah, borrows, borrows from yeah, this quite a bit. yeah. Oh yeah, like when they say yeah. the Puritan Puritan is coming home, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All this, these connections to from his work from you know in the past, and then you notice it from stuff he did in the future. I like what I like about Claude's work is drawing the comparisons. You know, yeah, 
I spent Christmas Eve of 2013 actually watching a David Copperfield show at a dinner in Las Vegas at the MGM. So it's a great experience. Um, Did he really cut himself in half and have his guts falling out and stuff? No. He had a... (laughs) He had kind of a puppet with him on the stage, though. And, that that uh, was did. described, I think, by Clark yeah, no, it was, in, in afterward there. I was like, really? That sounds pretty extreme. Well, yeah. I have a special that David Copperfield did back in the 80s. Do you guys remember when he, he, he claimed to do this performance at the Bermuda Triangle and he brought back a ship? Yeah, I, yeah, uh, I, I kind of I remember the news okay. about that, but I didn't watch it. Okay, Ryan, you're probably the only one who remembers because you're you're older than I am. But I remember watching that in the 80s. And, uh, you know, there was a great series of specials by David Copperfield where he claimed no camera tricks and no <laughs> editing. And it's like they were totally edited. They oh, were yeah. totally camera <laughs> tricks. Yeah. Like when he levitated over the Grand Canyon while Bonnie Tyler or whatever was singing uh, – uh, I need a hero or something, and 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 there's a helicopter and they're like, we're tracking him. He's flying over the Grand Canyon, and you see like his, and you see David Copperfield like legs crossed, floating over the Grand Canyon, and it's like totally fake. Yeah, <laughs> totally fake. Or when he walked through the the Great Wall of China, and uh, of course he walked through the Great Wall of China, but th- both the entrance and the exit. They were covered by a sheet, and there was a light behind it, so you only see the shadow of him going through the wall, and then <laughs> the shadow of him coming out the other side of the wall, and then he's like, oh, no, he's kind of stuck, and he tries, and he starts pushing himself and grasping his arms, and is trying to come out of the other side, and then finally <laughs> pushes himself out. It's like the Great Wall of China yeah. is birthing David Copperfield. And um, <laughs> or when he uh, made the Statue of Liberty disappear. That was a big special for him, too. Right, right, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. I think he did this one. Yeah, the worst kinds of magic tricks are the ones that they do on television because it's like, yeah, geez, yeah. that's yeah. not even that's not even skill, right? I mean, that's just yeah, editing. like uh, yeah. When I, when when Chris Angel claimed that he was going to reproduce the, the Harry Demore, uh, not the Harry Demore, the, the Philip Swan the, uh, illusion. Last yeah. illusion in the, yeah. the Lord of Illusions, right? Yeah. With the swords, and then he turned that thing into kind of a mentalist trick. I was so disappointed about yeah. that, to yeah, be honest. I was, I was like, too. that didn't really overwhelm me at all. It's I, like I, I never I, got around to watching it after hearing the descriptions of it. It's like, eh, I think I'll pass. And <laughs> then I found like on forums and stuff, like people who were there in Las Vegas watching the taping, and they were like, oh man, that that thing was. They kept cutting and retaking and cutting and doing <laughs> other things. Oh, geez. and it's yeah. like it, it was not like an entire performance like from beginning to end at all you know and uh and so i was so disappointed to hear that but uh well, but yeah that's that's these... tv right yeah it's, it's movie magic right so right you right. can even make a person disappear with a vhs camcorder i mean you film, <laughs> sure. you film a person yeah. and then you pause it and you make yeah, it walk it's out it's of the, the frame and then frame. you turn it back on again that's yeah. what george uh, george millier did Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, trip to the moon, right? Yeah. 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 I guess some people probably thought that was kind of magic at the time. Oh, yeah, for the time. Yeah, that yeah. was mind-blowing, I'm sure. Yeah. Like when Lumiere came up with the um, that movie about the train arriving at the station. Yeah. And it's like the train is just moving towards the camera, and then it stops just before it hits the camera. And there were people running out of the theater <laughs> when yeah. they were watching that for the first time. Oh, like the train like, was oh, no, it's a train. The, come yeah. through the screen and hit them. That's funny. So, hey, you know, that's again. But I mean, yeah, if you've never seen, you know, a piece of cinema for the first time, seeing a moving image coming at you had to be shell shocking for the time. Sure. Yeah, I sure. suppose that's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I we, think so. We, we take it for granted, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, it's uh, I, I really enjoy this, this um, play script. Um, I hope that. The list of the play scripts to come is going to be long. and Yeah, um, yeah same here. It seems One just thing knowing I, the way that Phil and Sarah do things that they'll probably get them all. Yeah, I'm sure. They, or at they least seem they like plan to. Us. Yeah. Yeah, and one thing I really love about these is reading the memory prophecy fantasy books by them. You know, you hear about these plays, but they're not accessible at all. And the yeah. fact that they're finally accessible and then you have the afterword and and the uh, the archival pictures and whatnot it's just it really 
ties them all together. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So it's not just a play script. It's also gives you context and history of, of, of the play. Yeah. Which is really nice. And it's a small package that's inexpensive. Yeah, it's very inexpensive, which I mean, one really sucky thing for being a Clive fan lately is just that all of these limited edition books and stuff, if you want to get the the Phil and Sarah introductions or afterwards or essays or whatnot, you have to spend between fifty to a hundred and fifty dollars for yeah, for the book right. just to get that extra material. Yeah. So yeah. And then there'll be a trade case version for five hundred or yeah, and then you have like the leather bound for two thousand, and just you know, <laughs> made. Like, yeah, and it's gonna it's gonna arrive two and a half years after you order. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, I'm the other sorry, thing. it's um, it's really just for like collectors who think of books as an investment in a way, and it's like, mm, I you know, I got the Thief of Always, the the anniversary edition, uh, uh, thanks to the the people at Seraphin and. Yeah. I'm never going to sell that book, to be honest. Yeah, that's how I'm with my collection. I, I couldn't, you know. Yeah, I would never, you know, like, you know, get rid of something that something ga somebody gave me, you know. I mean, that's, yeah. it's a very – it becomes very personal then. Yeah. Right. I mean, I'm trying to sell this this uh, piece of art uh, by John Bolton uh, that's from the first story in the first issue of Hellraiser, and it's really – it's 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 breaking my heart to have to get rid of it, but it's like I really have to move out of state and yeah. and it's complicated right now and money is tight, but it's like yeah. it, it hurts me when I have to put that thing up on eBay and it's it's like oh man I, yeah, I hope I nobody bids on it, but at the same time <laughs> I want to yeah. sell it. Yeah, but, I was yeah. just shipping out my entire collection of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles comics and. Oh. Uh, and I had them, and, and I've been organizing them since like 1987, something like that. You know, I've been collecting and organizing them, and and seeing, you know, it's no fault of Jennifer's, but seeing her just kind of pull them out and randomly stuff them into these priority mailboxes. I'm like, oh God, you're getting them all out of order. <laughs> and and, uh, and then I'd have to stop myself and go, yeah, this it doesn't matter. They're not gonna, they're not mine anymore. Somebody already paid for them. And yeah. So at the end of the play script, like I said, you have the uh, fine line between Divin Trigger and Divinity. You have uh, pictures from 1978 of the performance. You have pictures of the manuscript as well, the final yeah. draft of the manuscript. And something that's really, really interesting for all you Barker heads out there, it's that there's a history of all the plays that they did from Quarry Bank School down to the Hydra Theater Company to the Theater of the Imagination, which was their first incarnation, to the Mute Pantomime Theater, and then the Daw Company. So pretty amazing. Oh, yeah, the Cockpit Youth Theater in 1982, which yeah. honestly I hadn't heard of them until oh, this wow. point. Is that in the Memory, Prophecy, and Fantasy books? I don't uh, remember reading sure. that, that, that. I've got title those, but there. I've not yeah. started reading them yet. Okay, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I know the the plays they did was Crazy Face, Subtle Bodies, and Colossus, which have been published, but yeah. I yeah. didn't realize that they were called Cockpit Youth Theater at the time. That's, I didn't. Uh, yeah, me neither. I, but I haven't read Volume Three. I think I've only read the first two. Yeah, same here. On page there's sixty-eight a, of the of the Magician book, there's a nice. Uh, Ad, I guess they put out maybe in the paper or something like that. A poster, mm -hmm. yeah, with that the, uh, Barker illustration. Yeah, it's a yeah, wonderful really, piece. It is. I first saw this in the Shadows in Eden book, so mm -hmm. nice to see it back here again. For anybody who'd never, uh... so this is totally handmade by Clive. You can tell the drawing is totally Clive Barker. Even the lettering, a farce yeah. in the style of the Commedia dell'arte. That's totally Clive Barker's handwriting. Yeah, right now. yeah, yeah. Very cool. Yep. Yeah, and it's interesting to see the timeline of these plays, you know, going up to 1983, which is like, you know, soon after the Books of Blood kind of changed mm -hmm. everything. Uh, before, yeah. Yeah, right. They go they go up to 1983, and then the Books of Blood were 1984, mm -hmm. so there was kind of no turning back after that, you know, no going back to the plays. yeah. Yep, I wonder if Clive could have become like a famous playwright um, if if the theater had took off more than it did. You know. Yeah, 
Yeah, and that's one thing that people talk about with Hellraiser. Oh, Clive Barker was a fledgling director. It's like, eh, kind of, not really. I mean, he, he had a lot of experience directing. It just was for for plays. Plays, yeah. 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 And Which, then the two short films. Yeah. That's, that's true. That's an excellent point, yeah. So he already knew the basics of how to stage a scene, how to frame a scene, you know, yeah. the art direction and all that. And, and uh, the character direction as well so yeah working and with hellraiser actors is a really, is um, and sorry yeah and, and hellraiser is a really intimate movie you know with the uh, you know few characters on screen at the same time which you know which it is so his his history as, as a as a play director and writer and stuff i think came in really uh, effective yeah, no, yeah, completely. I mean, that could maybe be one of the reasons why it was called a staircase film is because it's <laughs> right. very, very isolated and very intimate, like a play. Yeah. For for most of the film. I think the first time we heard that was on Leviathan, right, where they were talking yeah, about that yeah. it was a staircase film. Which I still don't know what that means, but sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Right. A lot of uh, a lot of shooting from the the landing of the staircase. I think. Yeah. So yeah, I, I totally recommend this play script, and if you can buy the two yeah. pack that is being offered at the Clive Barker Archive, where you can buy the History of the Devil and the Magician. And Ryan, what's the name of the other two that you mentioned? Hunters in the Snow. Yeah, Hunter in the Snow. And, and Crazy and Face. Crazy Face are coming next. And I think... uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jose. No, I was just going to say there's a picture from Hunters in the Snow in the Shadows in Eden book where Clive is disguised as a vampire, vampire hunter, I think. So that's that's oh. what I was going to say. Cool. Uh, well, it, for, yeah, for Hunters in the Snow, that's uh, isn't there a character that would later on uh, have kind of morphed into the Hell Priest Pinhead? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So what I'm I curious think, to know what that is because of, yeah yeah I think that I think Phil and Sarah said whatever character that Doug Bradley had played for that play would would uh, be reminiscent later on of of Pinhead. So was uh, yeah. the character called the Patriarch or something? I yeah, forgot. something like that. I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I, I was just gonna say those should be available later this month. Last I checked, they said that uh, that they would be available in February. So oh, perfect. Those two plays should be coming anytime now. Perfect. So we should have an announcement on that when they soon on their website. Yeah. And another thing that I don't want to don't want to jump the what do you call it? Jump the shark. Jump uh, the gun. Jump the gun. Jump yeah, the jump gun. The right. Thank you. I am English is a second language to me. Jump, <laughs> jump the shark works just as good. It means the same thing. Yeah. No, it's it's I, jump the shark is like when the TV show does something stupid and then nobody watches it anymore. Yeah, or uh, nuke oh, the okay. fridge. Got it. So I don't want to jump the gun, but uh, we do have a, a, a play script um, uh, from 1982, I think. Um, for the secret life of cartoons. And I'm not sure what we're going to do with that yet, but when I posted a photo of it on my Facebook, um, someone asked, hey, do you know if Phil and Sarah are going to release this? And and Phil and Sarah confirmed that, yes, they are releasing it, and that the version that I had was probably the West End rewrite, because the secret life of cartoons was a play that actually had some a good deal of success when they when they uh, put it uh, together and then they had a West End production and all that and um, so they they said that I think mine is 1984 rewrite I'm sorry and they said they had the 82 original and the 84 rewrite so they were thinking about which versions to include and how to how to uh, publish it mm. so we know for sure that there's other play scripts on the way and uh, yeah I yeah. hope they're they're going to be as exhaustive and informative and chock full of extra material as these were. I think I'm, it's really I'm sure cool. they will be. Yeah. And and I know I know a lot of the people out there listening are collectors, and so I mean, how could you not want to have some of these plays that have never been been published before? Yeah, it's it's a great way until we get more Aberat possibly or yeah. something else. It's a great way to keep the 
the spring flowing, so to speak, yeah. with, uh, yeah. with stuff that's already there. It's already done. It's It's been tried and proven and edited. And, you know, all you got to do is uh, put the extra material in it and pack it and release it. So yeah. that's good. And the Imaginer books have just been churning out as well. Yes. From yeah. Phil and Tara. So. Since they have you been over, getting those, they... Marcus? Oh, what, what was that, Rob? Have you been getting those, Marcus, all the Oh, editions? yes. Yeah. Have you? No, those are... Uh... Those I've are got some the of my first two, things. but I've not got the rest of them. I'd love to get the, the uh, three through I, five. Like I, I really do love what what Tom had done with the first two volumes, but ever since Phil and Sarah took over, I oh, mean, I'm sure, it, yeah. it's just been above and beyond. I my favorite one is volume three for sure, just because I like the uh, the collection of paintings that they had chosen, but just their their exhaustive just research and information and just, you know, everything that they compile within those is so informative. And it's almost like a, uh, it reminds me of actually like a, of a philosophy book because there's so many just, you know, I, uh, interviews with Clive and stuff just going on about his philosophy of art. And oh, cool. I, I personally love I'm that. I'm sure you most. love that. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, the Imaginer books are, 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 the best for me. Yeah. And, uh, I'm I looking can't... at the Clive Barker archive website right now. And I just want to announce that imagine volume one is actually sold out, but oh. there's still the oh. deluxe edition for number one, which starts at $600. Oh. You have the volume two deluxe edition starts at 410. You still have the volume two at $110. Uh, and then volume three is still available both in normal and deluxe and uh, as well as volume four and volume five is available for pre-order. Yeah. Um, and I noticed that the books have become more accessible in price for, mm -hmm. for example, volume four, the deluxe edition was 410. Now deluxe for volume five pre-order is 395. Oh. And uh, volume five pre-order for the normal version is a hundred dollars. So it's all available on the Clyde Barker archive.com. Yeah. Where's the first two were uh, just Kickstarter only, but in, in regards to the first volume, uh, I think I got an email from Thomas Nagovin of century guild that they still had some uh, copies of the first imaginer, uh, whether or not those are, Slightly, slightly damaged yeah i think they just might be in perfection copies mm -hmm. uh, that are available for purchase so if anyone is looking for volume one that might be the That's person the ask yeah sure if you don't mind a a, a dent or a a, a a little nick in the binding here and there That's yeah well it's either idea. that or you have to go on ebay and you know they can go to like 500 bucks just Ooh. for the the Yikes. standard so yes. yeah it's going to be an excellent series, though, when it's completed, you know, and, and you can see all the little letters making up the Imaginer name on your shelf. It's going to be pretty amazing for anybody who has that. And at the rate they're going, it seems like probably they'll be done in, in like two years, maybe, because, I mean, it, they were originally one a year under, yeah. under Century Guild. You know, every year there was a Kickstarter for them. And then once they got to number three, Phil and Sarah, it seemed like started ramping it up and and they were coming out you know eight months and six months yeah apart. i honestly think it might be be less than two years because imaginer five should be coming out in the next month i think they said oh, march yeah. is is the release and then after that the pre-order for imaginer six will come up so i would imagine that we would get six probably by the end of the year too so wow. yeah i and mean there's and there's only two left yeah yeah so they're they've been They've been churning them out, and you know, as a Clive Barker fan, and sadly, we haven't gotten any new material from Clive in a while. So, like yeah. you guys said, it, it it keeps you satiated for for those of us who love getting new Clive stuff. And oh, there's yeah. there's so many new uh, paintings that aren't in the archive. Uh, you know, I I'm I'm always want to to peruse the uh, the online archive and and look at all the paintings. And uh, there's so many paintings in the Imaginer books that aren't online at all. So yeah. that, that it's a wonderful thing to flip through the pages and see paintings that I've never seen before. So they're highly recommended. To take a quote from 
uh, the magician, there's a part where Cogliostro says, to hear is to obey. So <laughs> yeah. everybody go to Clive Barker Archive, <laughs> get the play <laughs> scripts, and pre-order yeah. Imaginer 5, to yes. hear is to obey. Yeah. And and get these, yeah, yeah, get the play scripts right, you said, and Imaginer 5. That's right. I think um, you can, I still haven't pre-ordered Hunter in the Snow and, and um, Crazy Face yet. I need to do that. No, I don't. I don't think they're uh, they're up for pre-order yet, are they? No, they're not. Oh, but they, you said they're they, gonna. They, they, they just teased them, I think, right? Yeah, yeah. No, I don't yeah. think they. I don't think they pre-order. I think they just. Uh, oh, they're I think just like they're up, here. They're they up. are. You could. You just. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of having you know with those those specialty publication companies having to wait, like you said, a year or two. Yeah. Uh, yeah. These these once they're done, they're done. Well, and, and yeah, we'll we'll uh, we'll have to keep an eye out for when they're actually available for pre-order, and we'll we'll be letting people know on the on the website uh, clivebarkercast dot com and on the this podcast too. Yes, excellent. Well, this was fun. Um, yes, I really like talking well, about the plays, and uh, and this one this one particularly was really neat because I I you know prior to this uh, I hadn't ever read it before. Yeah, same here. I'd heard about it, but I, yeah, uh, I, never I didn't heard know what it was about. about. It's Reddit. very short, very sweet, and very funny. <laughs> yes. yes. There you yeah. go. Yeah, I expected there to be more, like, executions or people getting killed, but really it, it's uh, it's really more of a comedy. And mm -hmm. and and, uh, and, <clears throat> and it's it's kind of thoughtful and dramatic at the same time. It, you know, yeah, it is. Uh, one, one note, one last note that I did have was... Uh, did you guys read the Infernal Parade at all? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I did. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's very good, Rob. I I do recommend that book as well. But uh, one of the stories is of a golem. Mm -hmm. uh, I forget. I forget the actual title of the short story, the but uh, the golem Elijah, I think. Yeah, yeah. And so you know, the golem is fashioned uh, in a very Promethean way from from mud. And uh, that really reminded me of the uh, homunculus, you know, yeah. except for their uh, fashion by by alchemy. But uh, it's yeah. And, uh, you know, you do actually you do feel sympathy. And I remember when I was reading that that story from the Infernal Parade, it, it is very solemn and very sad. And so I couldn't help but have that same feeling of hearing Pantalone's story start just seeping in and starting to just feel that that somberness and that sadness yeah and he's learning to, he's learning to, his own story as uh, at the same time as the audience does yeah yeah so yeah yeah the golem elijah is that creature on the wheel right yeah yeah that's pretty impressive all right, uh, so that was The Magician, episode 167. Thanks for joining us, Rob, Marcus, and Ryan. Yeah. And this podcast, Having No Beginning, shall have no end. Find the show notes for this episode and join the discussion over at www.cliveparkercast.com, where we have news and links to all the ways you can connect with us. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and every other place you can find podcasts. The Clive Barker Podcast is an independent editorial podcast and news blog that is not affiliated with or under contract by Sarah Fameek. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. Thanks for listening.